Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to Planet Zoo. Today we're going to be making a brand new habitat for two species of animals that I haven't actually spoken about. So I've been exploring around and kind of playing around with like some ideas and stuff and we obviously had already mapped out the animals we were going to put in here but that was always subject to change. Nothing's going to be taken out but we are going to have some new additions and today we're going to work on a habitat for giant anteaters and the Baird's Tapir. This is going to be a shared habitat because these guys, they tend to just live in their breeding pairs and once they've bred, the other animals are expected to kind of move on. And that's going to be the plan for this habitat. So we're going to dive straight into our speed build and we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing and why we're doing it and why I felt this area would be perfect for this new habitat. Let's dive into it. So the first thing I wanted to do was duplicate the backstage area from the Dwarf Cayman Habitat. I really like how this one turned out and I wanted to use it again but a little bit differently this time. So what we're doing is we're just dropping it in place and then flattening the terrain and this is going to be a sleeping area for our two new species. Then we're going to come around here and just flatten out all of this hill here. Obviously it will eat into our mountain biome a little bit but I have a couple of different ideas on how we're going to develop this and like I said the uh, basic construction, basic terraforming we did a few episodes ago is always going to be subject to change as things come about. Which is why this habitat's come about actually. Uh, I saw this little bit of dead space here and decided that I would build a new habitat on it. So again, we're mapping out the barrier here and it actually ends up increasing. You can see we're just running up to the end of this pool here. And then I, well, eventually I uh, made the water go into it. So there's a little bit of a pond area for them. You can see us here taking it all out and then putting a little bit more landscaping in there before we eventually put the water back in. And we get this little pond area here. And the simple kind of adjustments to make here will be involving bringing in like a, a little bit of a walkway like we already have in the other habitats. But for now, we're coming back inside of the building to make some adjustments here. I want to move the door so that it kind of comes out on this side of the habitat and that just means we need to make a few more adjustments, swap this wall piece into the area where the door used to be and then adjust our arbor wooden panels so that everything's a little bit smoother. And it's very simple, uh, just adapting something that we already have in place. And then we pop this in and we had to double check that our animals were going to be able to come in and out of this building. Unfortunately, the giant anteater and the bed's tapir are a lot bigger than the dwarf caimans, thus the name dwarf caiman. But uh, <laughs> we made this work and just kind of increased the size and the width of the actual habitat gate here. And that just made everything fit quite nicely. You can see we're doing a little bit more adjusting here, just getting the colours right so that the concrete all matches up. And then I actually checked to see if the animals could use them and found that they couldn't. So we made that adjustment after the fact. But everything's lining up pretty nicely. And the next phase of development here is going to be to just make sure that our barriers are all null. And then we move on and put in our barrier. But for now, we're going to have a little look at our terraforming and what we're going to need to do. So here we are pulling away this little walkway here and putting that into the habitat itself so that it kind of cuts off any escape routes via the waterway there. This changes though. Um, eventually when I put the animals in, the space that they had that was like navigable area wasn't big at all. There wasn't a lot and that's because a lot of rock work is to follow. I'll talk about that in a little bit though. I wanted to use the barriers from the other side of the uh, Dwarf Cayman habitat just because I thought that would be a nice bit of continuity for the barriers that we've got here. And we'll change this up as we move into a different continent or different biome. Got to remember here we're looking mainly at tropical and South American animals here. And I thought the bed's tape here would fit in quite nicely here. I'm not so sure about the giant anteater, but also one thing I have discovered in doing this, with the uh, size of this habitat being quite small, we may need to separate these two eventually. And what I would probably do is move the bed's tape here in with the cababaras and leave the wonderful large giant anteaters on their own in this one. Uh, I just think it would be a, a, a better use of the space, but that's something I can think about later on. So once our basic barrier was put in, we then had to set about matching things up with the terrain. And this is where our rocks come in. So I just took a massive swatch from the opposite side of the Capybara habitat and started playing around with that. 
There was a lot of adjustments to be made and some things get deleted and moved around but this was quite a large scale development when it came to using these rocks and it took a while to get this right. Once it was right though, that's when I made the discovery that there wasn't actually a lot of navigable area for our animals and we had to increase the size of the habitat. And overall I think it's been quite a nice discovery because it's allowed us to create a pretty unique looking habitat. I'll explain a little bit more about how it changes when we get to that point. But for now you can just see us moving these rocks into place, getting everything lined up nicely so that it looks like a wonderful natural creation as opposed to something that's just been slapped down. That's something that's always been very important to me when building. I've said this several times. We take away a little bit of the terrain there and then merge a few more rocks in, just building up a nice shape really. We also have to be very aware of the fact that while the beds tapir just have little stumpy legs, they can jump and uh, we don't want them to be able to jump out of this habitat. So we're building these rocks in and making it look really nice and have a nice little flow down into the habitat itself using those scaviola bushes to fill in any like imperfections and gaps and then we want to move some more rocks around here and this is where i'm kind of going to start backing into this walkway that goes down into the the underground portion of this part of the zoo and this was difficult i don't know if this path's actually going to stay or we're going to reroute it and have the guests go somewhere else but as you'll see later on it kind of works where it is now because of changes that have been made to this habitat. So it may stay in, but we're going to need to do a lot of work to get that path looking right. And I thought it was a good idea to start that now with these rock formations. Once this all wraps around though and fits in nicely with the barrier, we can start moving on to some more developments. Again, a combination of rock work and foliage work. You can see that we're kind of getting a nice little palette going with this part of the zoo. Obviously, scaviola bushes feature heavily, but that's because the foliage in the South America and tropical biome, there's not a lot of choice when it comes to large scale patches of foliage that cover a lot of ground and have the like three dimensional and multi dimensional feel that the scaviolas have. You can play around with them and sink them in very easily. And there's not a lot of other bushes that we can actually use as opposed to if you're dealing with like a temperate environment where you've got quite a lot. There's the buffalo grass, there's the Yorkshire fog grass and all of those little meadow flowers and stuff you can use in temperate environments. Whereas if we were to put them in here, guests would complain and being on hard mode, it would lead to refunds. So we're just mapping out little bits and pieces to do there and we can finally now put in our enrichment items. You'll see if you look at the year we've jumped ahead quite a little bit because I wanted to get all of the research done for both the Baird's Tapir and the giant anteater. I keep pausing when I'm about to say anteater because I forget what animal it is. <laughs> so coming in here and putting in the bedding here, thankfully they aren't like the dwarf came in and able to sleep anyway. They need that little bit of hard shelter and a nice patch of bedding to go to sleep on. And that leads me to another thing that I've done with this habitat that's a little bit different. There's not actually a staff path going up to the gateway. It's a guest path. So the guests can actually come into this backstage area and uh, view the beds tapir and the anteater in their sleeping quarters from multiple angles. They've got the angle running directly along where the barriers are, and then they can actually go inside the backstage area and see a little bit more. Over to this enrichment item. You can see it doesn't look amazing, this like ant hill. It's very difficult to fit in nice and natural with the rest of the landscape we've got here. And what I actually ended up doing was putting down a couple of patches of savanna uh, cladding. This kind of blended in very nicely with the enrichment item, but it still doesn't blend in very well with the rest of the environment. So we had to do a little bit more work. What I then did was mess around with a couple of terrain paintbrushes. So we ended up using sand with a little bit of a, a, a like a gradient going into some soil. Then we come in with some dynamic mossy cladding. Put that down and we're starting to build up a nice little profile here where you've got that difference in texture and colour to the rocks, but it starts to merge a little bit better. We came in with some more tropical rocks just to give it that feel where it's kind of really merging into our present environment. And then we came in with some more bushwork with the scaviolas and a couple of flowering plants, plumeria, and then a couple of the roots from the strangler figs came in as well. 
We used some monkey face orch orchid orchids orchids orchids. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I've forgotten how to speak. Monkey faced orchids, and then a few other bits and pieces as well. But the main thing was to create enough of a distraction and make it look like these savannah rocks are actually just mud piles. Swiss cheese plants also going in because they gave a nice bit of foliage coverage, but I really like the holes in those Swiss cheese leaves because they come right through and you can see what's going on underneath. And there it is, the monkey face orchids as well, and then a lobster plant. And I think that finished it all off quite nicely and it merged in really well. The other tree that I wanted to bring in here, as well as tamarinds, which you'll see later, was the yellow iper tree. I think it looks really nice. The colours on it are beautiful and it really gives a nice little pop to an environment. Coming in again with some lobster plants and the uh, wonderful plumeria flowers, just to add some little pops of freshness and colour against that green background. Scaviolas once again adding extra dimensions to the plants and the uh, rock work there as if they're growing out of cracks and are just kind of starting to overgrow into the rest of the habitat. We're really fleshing this one out. We've got a lot that we can play around with because the anteaters and the bird's tapir can have up to 100% coverage when it comes to foliage. I wanted to put in these coconut palms because I think that's a really nice continuation and it gives a beautiful little differential when you're kind of transferring from one environment to the next. The coastal mangroves as well I think give a really nice finishing touch with their roots. Now we've jumped ahead quite a bit here and you can see we're underground right now messing around with some rocks and this took a lot of time and I'm not quite 100% happy with it but I think it looks really good and it it does give the habitat a finishing touch that I thought it was missing. And this came about after checking out how much navigable area our animals had. There wasn't a lot. I think they needed about 900 square foot or square meters and they only had about six or 700 once we would put all of the rock work and everything in. So as you can see, the animals are now going to be able to walk through that little bit of river, past a waterfall when I finally put that in, and down into this little cave system here, and guests that are coming down the walkway into that extra area underneath the cave and out into the grassland part of the wetlands area, they're going to be able to look into this little cave and see our bed's tapir or our giant anteaters. And you can see it developing here little bit by little bit. I haven't shown you too much rock work in here because we've already done quite a bit, but we're just building it up little by little, making sure every now and then that our animals can't escape and they are also able to actually get down into this area because it's quite a steep slope. And I did end up putting in a few rocks just to make a nice little pattern or a walkway for them to actually get down into this area. But we've had quite a bit of rain here in Arcadia, which has been really nice for testing because they all seek hard shelter once it starts to rain and they're all running down into this cave system, which is really nice to see. Of course, I had to fit in the waterfall somehow because that's actually going to become quite a prominent part of this next area where water is going to pour off here into what's actually going to be our California sea lion habitat and a few other animals that are going to be able to be down there. I then tried making a staff walkway because I realised that if animals um, go to the toilet in this cave, our keepers can't actually get there to clean it up. So I put this little walkway in, but then I realised that my staff still can't get to it. So that all ended up changing again, and I rerouted the entire thing, and you'll see later on what that looks like. Coming into this cave, I wanted to add a little bit more of a dimension to it. So you already saw me do this in the Capybara habitat, but I wanted to do it on a little bit more of an advanced scale. Using these twilight stalactites and trying to just match the colours to the rockwork as best we can, we then start building up like little mud pillars that then sit against the rockwork and form what kind of looks like silt and sediment that's kind of built up over time. You've got to imagine this is not actually a completely enclosed cave. It's pretty exposed on multiple sides. So we're going to get a lot of rainwater and stuff coming in. We're going to get condensation forming in this cold area that's then going to start depositing silt, sediment and all sorts on the back wall of that cave. And I wanted to kind of give an effect that that was what was happening. Obviously, this looks very patchy. So we then put in some more rocks and then a few strangler fig roots just to really bulk it out. And I think it creates a really effective scene. I think it looks really nice and it, it just adds that extra little bit of dimension to this area as well. 
We could also do stuff like put some woodwork and things in here so it looks like we've actually come into this cave system and bolstered it a little bit so that it doesn't start collapsing. That could be something that we experiment with a little bit further down the line when it comes to actually developing this entire cave system. I finally got to use the lava vines, which I've been wanting to use for a while and kind of really like play around with. They are just kind of popped in there, I guess, but I think they look really cool. They definitely finish off the habitat. And once again, strangler fig roots, really cool, really give that extra kind of dimension to a habitat and help it all stand out a lot more. And then it was just a case of filling this place out with greenery, dynamic mossy rocks, just to give it an extra couple of different like streaks of colour throughout it so that it's brightened up a little bit more and doesn't look like this kind of like flat grayscale habitat area. And it looks really nice. I'm really happy with how it looks. You're going to get multiple viewing areas here because at some point I'm making sure that my guests are going to be able to walk along this area and they'll actually be able to look up onto that platform and see the uh, Baird's Tapir and the uh, giant anteater in their habitat, which is really cool. I think it's a really nice view. It's going to give them a lot to see, and it actually doesn't interfere a lot with the habitat and the uh, stress levels of the animals at all. Of course, we filled it out with a little bit of mist because I think that would be a really nice finishing touch. And there you can see what's going on there with the waterfall as well. Finishing off with a couple of tamarind trees for some extra orangey colours, and then we're just about done. So, it's been a short episode this week, but I want to thank you all again for watching. I really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoy the tour, and I will see you next week for another episode of Planet Zoo. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.